When did you begin your career at Walton EMC and, and sort of what was it like when you started? Well, I actually started to work in 1979, January of 1979. I had, of course, I guess you know I worked with George Power before I came here, so um, I had to turn in a, a long resignation with them. They forced me to give them two months or whatever. I, I don't recall. It's been quite a few years ago. but. Um, and you might be interested to know, before I accepted the job at Walton MC, I'd been offered a job at, at uh, uh, is it not Greystone, Carroll MC, and at Jackson MC. I was offered two jobs before I took this one at Walton MC, but I felt like this was the right place to come for, for my family and uh -huh. for me. Uh -huh. So it started in January, and I didn't even know how to get from the office to, to where we lived. We rented a house over in... Uh, uh, off of Church Street, I can't, remember, I can't remember where the house was. But we rented a house over there and I couldn't even hardly find how to get from the office to the, to the, uh, to the house. And then in February, after I'd been here for less than 30 days, we had an ice storm, a really bad ice storm. So I just stayed at the office for a week and slept in the, uh, actually in the ladies' restaurant. There's a couch back there in their little reception area and I slept back there so none of the ladies could go to the bathroom while I was asleep. I had to go somewhere else, but um, so that, that's that's when I started. It was um, uh, something different, but I guess I learned the system probably better for the eye, because of the ice storm because I was able to get out and and ride a little bit after after the first two or three days because I can't remember exactly how long it lasted, maybe four days or whatever. But it, it was a very severe ice storm for us, and the first one we'd had since probably '73, and that was in '79. So. Um, but it was it was certainly different coming from from a a big IOU to a co-op, which I felt like I fit in better it, to start with when I took the job at Walton EMC, and and it's turned out to be true. So it's been a, been a good good career. So when you started back in '79, kind of give us a little bit of a picture of. What was Walton EMC like back then? What were the typical members like back then? You know, was it rural? Was it still mostly farming? Or, or just kind of, what was the feel back then? <laughs> Both. Uh, we were very urban in the Snellville area. And, and Watkinsville was kind of beginning to be, become a little urban because of the University of Georgia. But Snellville was, was very urban. I mean, it was very much a lot of growth there. Uh, a lot of subdivisions going in. We, in fact, we had a lot of the crews from Monroe were going up there to work on a daily basis to help out. Uh, but then around Monroe, it was just strictly rural. I mean, you could, you know, you could get on Highway 78 and see no cars between Monroe and the office, and you can't do that today. Mm -hmm. But it was different back then because of that. We were just, we, we were two systems. We were a very rural system, and then we were a very urban system as well. Um, but, uh, it was just uh, getting used to, I guess, that, that kind of arrangement because Snellville, the people there, couldn't stand their power to be off, uh, more so today than back then, but they, they didn't want the power off at all. And some people here might call and say, well, if you're down this way, get the power back on when you, you, know, when you can. Uh, so it was just a totally different system uh, from one end to the other. And, uh, but it was, it was uh, very good system, had a lot of good people working here. Uh, a lot of them were just getting used to the 25 kV because we were, we were changing from 12 kV to 25 kV at that time because of, so we could have, you know, carry the extra load that we were growing so fast because that first year we were, we were less than 100 megawatts in total load uh, in 79 in the summer. And that I can't remember whether it was that summer or the summer of 80 that we actually went over 100 megawatts for the first time. And we were still a little less than 30,000 numbers of consumers back then, and, and we were growing to the tune of 4,000 new services a year. I mean, the, the, the growth through those 70s and 80s were just tremendous that we had at Walton MC. Uh, so it was just a, it was a, a, a transition time, I guess I'd say, for us from being a very, very rural co-op to being one of, one of the larger co-ops. And, and we just continued to grow through the years. Uh, and you know, at now, now to 140,000 roughly uh, meters. 
So it's, it's just really grown grown a lot, and, and it's grown the whole the whole time. We had a little slowdown back in the you know uh, 2008, 9, 10, and but it, but we still we added customers every single year, even, even when we had the slowdown. So it's just been a period of, of high growth, then slow growth, and now back back in medium growth now. <laughs> Um, how how would you describe the character of our service territory now? Uh, well, now I guess we're more of a, an urban system. We have we serve about 17 to 18 meters per mile. Uh, that's pretty high for a for a rural for a co-op, what you call a rural co-op. But I don't consider us rural, except down in, in the Rutledge area a little bit. Uh, we're we're really a very urban system. Uh, all across the system now. I mean, you know how the, how the subdivisions have, have added, been added in Monroe, Monroe area. And Oconee County is one of the fastest growing counties in the in the in the state, uh, in the nation. But uh, it's just we're just a, a very urban system. There's subdivisions everywhere, and, and commercial growth as well. Um, and we're I think about the 17th or 18th largest co-op in the country out of 900 co-ops, whatever many co-ops there are. Uh, we're about number 17 or so in, in size, uh, so it, it's it, we're just more of an urban system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when when you started with Walton EMC, tell us a little bit about what your job was, what your responsibilities were, what what you did day to day. Well, I came in as I, back then we called directors instead of vice presidents. I was director of engineering and operations. So all the engineering and operations aspects of the company basically was in my area. Uh, that'd be from purchasing line trucks to, to working with the crews on the kind of cutouts or arresters we were using or, or transformers that we were buying and, and other things. All of that was in, in my area. Um, and like I say, it was a transition period from going from a very, very rural system to, to, continue, to growing like we were. So. Uh, we, we were involved in just a lot of different things when I first came. Uh, and like I say, our crews were just getting, they'd been working uh, 25 kV hot for a while, but um, you know, just didn't have some of the tools that would help you to do the job. They just didn't know about it. It wasn't, it wasn't their fault. It's just that uh, as we had progressed to going from basically cold line work to live line work, um, you know, they they just needed a lot of equipment and materials, tools. So that first couple of years I was here, we spent. Uh, uh, Randall Pugh was the manager then, and I told him I said, Randall, don't look at what we're going to be buying, because you you'll say no. But I, <laughs> I said we're going to be spending a lot of money on different tools and equipment that that we need, that the men men should have. So we started doing that, and 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 uh, it was a a growing process for us as as we did that through the years to become where we are today and where, we, where we've been for a number of years. I think we've got some of the best linemen around and um, they deserve to, to have the necessary equipment to do the job. So it was a, just a transition period for us when I first came and like I say, all the engineering and operations, uh, which included the shop, mechanic shop, uh, apparatus shop, warehouse. Um, so they were probably, I don't know, 75, 80 people. Um, and we had had the three offices. Uh, Watkinsville was a much smaller office, of course, but uh, and Snellville was growing. Um, we were we were in a little office downtown Snellville, and I remember Calvin G. He was a line foreman. One day I was there, and he was going out with a line pole. Um, I mean, a pole behind a line truck, <laughs> and I, th I he traffic had to slam on their brakes because of him pulling out with that pole. So we started looking for a place to to move out away from downtown Snellville. And it actually, we did that in 82. We built the new office in Snellville in 82, and now it's completely surrounded by subdivisions. Uh, not quite as bad as downtown Snellville was when we were there, but uh, we got schools just right next to us and, and everything else. Uh, um, so it was, it was a, a fun time because of the uh, transition from going, I guess, from a very rural co-op to, to more of an urban co-op. So it was good, I think, for you know, for everybody, for, and me, and me included. And for people who might not know, it used to be when linemen worked on the lines, they cut the power off. Everybody's power was off. <laughs> we used to, but we stopped doing that pretty quick after I came, because uh -huh. people just started saying, "You can't have my power off." <laughs> and today, with computers and people working at home, I mean, 
If you stay, you say you want to have somebody's power off, they say, well, you can do it tonight at midnight, you know, but you can't do it now. And I guess nowadays it would be extremely rare to cut power off to do some kind of operation. It is. We do have to do it sometimes, but, and people are, are, are still good to work with us, but, you know, you have to have a good reason why you want to have the power off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but yes, back then, yeah, e even pulling in new new conductors or new threads, if he's going from a single phase line to a three phase line, you know, they, they pulled it in basically coal and and we changed that pretty quick after I came we started we, we bought some a tensioner and a puller so that we could pull the wire in in uh, in under tension and it's so much so much safer safer for the public as well as safer for us um, I mean used to you just pull it in and you sag the wire in and if somebody has happened to be walking over the wire and you pull it up when they were walking on it you know it's <laughs> kind of kind of dangerous <laughs> but we've we've come a long way uh, our, our guys just do an excellent job. So, to kind of uh, end this section, uh, what uh, what what was it like working at Walton EMC back then? Just generally. <laughs> well, for me coming in, coming from a large IOU, I mean, there were some. I'm sure a lot of hesitant, hesitant people who wondered what was going to go on and what was going to happen. But I spent a lot of time traveling the system and and trying to get with the crews to see what what they needed. So we started buying equipment and buying things um, that, that made their jobs easier. Uh, we had some, and, and I know this is, I'm not going to give names of course, but we had Lyman and Snell that made Lyman and never been in a bucket truck. Not because of, we just didn't have a bucket truck. I think there was one bucket truck, maybe two in Snell when I came, and one in Monroe and one in Watkinsville. So we just did not have a lot of equipment that to, to, to work 25 kV hot and do the things that our folks do, we just didn't have the equipment. So we started buying equipment and, and doing things. I mean, back then you get a line truck for fifty sixty thousand dollars $60,000. You know, today they're three hundred dollars uh, and can't get them. But back then we just did not, and it was because we were in that transition period. So it probably took somebody like me from the outside that had at least seen other things because Georgia Power, you got to they 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 spend money on equipment and, and things that they do, so at least I had learned a lot of things there and was able to, to help a lot. And our people were very interested in it too, because we'd get a lot of demonstrators and they'd get people to come in with different uh, tools and different uh, kinds of materials, and we'd try it out and they'd go out with the crews and and do it. Just like we used to use an, an example, a, a bust anchor. You put an anchor, dig a hole, about a six eight inch hole and you put an anchor down in it and you'd bust it with a uh, a tool that went down in there and spread it apart well and then we started going to screw anchors where you just screw them in the ground with the, with the auger rather than then uh, dig a hole and, and bust it so just things like that i mean we went all over the system with a demonstrator doing doing that kind of thing so people could learn it and unfortunately one time we, we went through a water line in snuffle and I, i've never seen so much water coming out of the ground in my life but you, you learn when things like that happen. But uh, just making that transition from, from you know, the old way to, to the new way uh, was really good. And everybody was very interested in, in, in what we could get uh, because we, we tried to get the very best and newest stuff that you could. could. Um, and so I think making that transition uh, was good for me and, and I think good for the co-op too because... Uh, we couldn't certainly stay like we were because we were growing so much. And like you say, people today, you know, they just cannot have their lights off at all, hardly. Uh, used to, if you had an ice storm, you know, if you went a week, you know, it was was okay. But you better not go a week today. Um, you know, maybe maybe three days, two days, and that's about it. And it's hard to get 140,000 people back on in three days if you have a system-wide uh, event to occur. So, um, I really enjoyed those 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 first few years because of those those kind of things. But time moves on, so you have to make changes and and, and uh, you know continue to improve. And I, and I think we've done that. We started a Lima's training program, which didn't didn't have that in in, in effect when I came. We started that, and we started a lot of things that uh, I think has helped us and helped our people to be. I, I think our work practices now are as good as as anybody's. Um, and I'm really proud of, of what our, our guys have done. I really am. Okay. All right.
I, I took I went back took a look at our newsletters about the time you came and I found a few headlines or issues of the day that were really being talked about so I'm gonna um, just read some of those and um, just see what your reaction or comment about them are and what happened and where they went right. one big thing was switch save and that's where the co-op would cut members uh, air conditioners or water heaters off to reduce mm -hmm. demand and so back then peak demand was a big deal so um, just talk about that a little bit what well our, the reason that we did that our wholesale power cost was based on more on demand charges than on on energy charges uh, the way that Oglethorpe system was designed, and we were getting most of our energy from Oglethorpe, uh, they charged so much for capacity, which was KW. They charged so much for, for KW, and then so much for your energy, and, and about 60 to 65% of your cost was, was capacity related. So if you had a very high demand in the summertime, which it was the summertime, the way the rates were set up, then you paid more the year round in capacity than, than say somebody else did. Um, so we, and I guess it was kind of a, uh, I don't know what, what, you, what you'd call it, but Cobb EMC, which was kind of like us, they were growing in the summertime, their demand was very high in the summertime. During one of the peak events uh, that Oglethorpe was having where you, you, you set your, your yearly peak that you paid for, per, per capacity or per KW, they had a breaker, they had a car to hit a pole and a breaker opened up. So instead of being 100 KW that they were paying for, they paid for 75. And suddenly they realized how much less their power bill was the next year because of that. So about the same time we started, and they did too, we started putting switches on air conditioners and, and water heaters so that we could cycle those. Uh, I think we did it seven minutes out of every hour or something. I forgot how we did it, but uh, maybe seven out of 30. But we'd actually cycle those air conditioners, turn so many, so many air conditioners off, which lowered our demand. And uh, we saved a tremendous amount of money by doing that. Um, I think at one time we had on like 50,000 air conditioner switches on our system. And back then we weren't but about 75,000 uh, numbers of accounts. Um, so it really saved us a tremendous amount of money on our capacity part of our bill, which you paid for the whole year, and you set it once a year during your peak times, and that was always in the summertime for us. So uh, that's the reason that we started this switch save program, as we called it. Um, we had, in fact, a lot of our employees actually put on switches for us after hours. Um, I remember a lot of them that put the switches on, and we had some uh, contractors that we hired that put them on during the daytime too. That's one reason we got them so many switches put on our system was because of the contractors that we used and then our employees. Our employees really did a good job putting them on. Um, so that was the reason that we started that program and it did it did save our members a lot of money back then. Um, so it was a, a very well received program too. I think uh, toward the end we were actually paying our, our members like, I can't remember the amount, $3 a month say, if they allowed us to do that, that we'd give them a, a credit on their power bill. So most people would allow us to do it. Today, I don't know if that allows us to or not. <laughs> Back then, they did, and it was uh, it was a program that really worked well for us. So the initial idea of reducing demand was really an accident. Kinda. I mean, I'm sure it, it was, somebody would have figured it out. But yeah, we would have figured it out anyway. But it because about that time, some of the other around the country, other other areas were doing it. Motorola and Scientific Atlanta. There were several different businesses that started about the same time pushing this uh, across the country and and it just so happened that Cobb EMC had that breaker to open up and uh, I heard through the grapevine that they just opened one or two up but I don't think that was true uh, but they may have who knows uh, we thought about it but we didn't do it but but we we, we got a lot of switches on really quick and it was uh, it was just one of those things that uh, a growing co-op, you have to do things to to save money as much money as you can. And that's what a co-op is to start with, because you know we we serve our members, and our members are the ones that we try to keep the price as low as we can uh, to. So we had to do everything that we could to lower our, our wholesale power bill, because eighty percent of our 
our cost is, is wholesale power. Still is today, was back then. Um, most co-ops average about 65%, and ours is over 80. So uh, it, it, it's to our advantage to do everything we can to cut back on our, on our capacity use. It's changed a little bit today. Now we have a winter and a summer uh, demand, so it's not quite the way it was when we did all the changes in Oglethorpe. We made all the changes there. We, we tried to get out of uh, so much the d demand related. It's still demand related a lot, but it's more 50-55% now than it was back then. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the headlines back then, and it still is today, is wholesale power costs oh, no are, are rising. Also back then, uh, the newsletter had a lot of stories on advocating nuclear power. Well, you had Hatch that was already online back then, and, and Vogel 1 and 2 went on in the, I want to say maybe the late 70s. Um, so it was, yeah, and, and nuclear power is just a lot more expensive because of building the plants. I mean, even back then, <clears throat> Vogel 1 and 2 thought we was going to build them for a billion and it was five billion, you know, whatever. But it took a lot longer to build them than we first thought, too. And, and then and we've seen the same thing now with Vogel 3 and 4. And they're just a very expensive plant to build, but once you get them built, the energy's cheap. Uh, but um, it, it's, 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 it certainly doesn't produce any uh, unwanted particles that goes in the air. Uh, very, very clean, clean energy. In the last headline, uh, and you already alluded to it just a tad, but about the time you got here, it looked like there was a major ice storm. Up to that point, the most severe in the co-op's history, 70% of the co-op's members were out, and it required 97 outside linemen to, co to come in to help, but power was restored in three days. Yeah. It, it, we did get help from everywhere we could get it. <laughs> I remember, I say, I was new, so I'd, I'd go up to Randall, or Randall Lee would come to the back, and I'd say, call and get us more help, as much as you can get. And um, um, it was, um, and our, our folks just really pull together when you get an ice storm or a, a, a wind storm or whatever, um, because, you know, service is, is really uh, what our members are paying for. I mean, yeah, the electricity is what they used turn on the lights and TVs and computers in today's world. Well, back then it was more water pumps and, you know, um, of course it was TVs because I do remember one guy called, it was a Super Bowl Sunday, we had an, uh, some outages, and he called, he said, I want my power on now, I want to see the Super Bowl. And I said, well, sir, I'm sorry, we just can't get it back on right now. Uh, and he, he had, had too much to drink, I'm sure, but he, he was celebrating whoever it was. And thank goodness we got his own about the time the game started. But it's just things like that, that back then you could, you know, I mean, back then we had, I think we had maybe seven phone lines that came into the office. And, you know, you couldn't carry multiple calls. It had to all be answered by individuals and we were all sitting there answering the phones. Um, it's just, times have just really changed as far as the outages and the way that you have to handle them. But yeah, that was, that was something, uh, getting the power back on that quick. We always, try to look at others uh, around us to see what they do and if, if we can get on quicker than, than Georgia Power, you know, we're usually pretty satisfied because they, they, they have a, uh, a storm plan just like we do. Um, and if we can get on quicker than them, I'm, I'm always pleased and we do just about every time get on a little bit quicker than Georgia Power does. All right. And here are here are a few stats from 1979 when you start in today. And so I'll, I'll uh, read these to you and then just see if you have any thoughts on them. So when you came in 1979, there were 31,000 members. Today, we're at about 138,000. Back then, there were 2,800 miles of line. Today, we're at 7,350. The average bill back then was $48. Today, it's 146. And in 1979, our revenue was about $15.5 million. Today, it's about $337.5 million. So, any thoughts on... Well, that's a lot of growth. Um, to go from, from 30,000 roughly to 140,000 members is, is 
I think a testament to, to how well I think that that our folks have worked together to to, to see that amount of growth in, in the short period of time, even though I've been here a long time, but it's still been a short career in a way uh, to see how our people have come together to, to be able to do that. And I, you didn't say anything about the, the size we are as far as demand, but I mean, our demand's grown from 100 megawatts to over 800 megawatts. And that's not including the, the Facebooks that we're serving. Um, so to see our system grow the way it was, and that's one reason we had to add so many miles of line. Um, not only do we put it in underground, about half of our lines are underground and half's overhead. And the subdivisions, you know, uh, you just dig, 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 take rock out and put the cable in. Uh, but that's a tremendous amount of growth in, in adding facilities uh, to serve to serve that many people. And I think that's a testament to the, how, how our folks work. Not only people answering the phones to, to get the information of where the people are moving so that we can set the meters and uh, you know get everything correct there but it's it's just a I think a tremendous testament to to how our people have worked together uh, to, to, to accomplish that um, I, I've, I've been very uh, pleased to be a part of that it's uh, I think it's some amazing growth how many years were you at Walton MC before you came CEO uh, 14. Okay. What was Walton EMC like at that time? We had one became manager. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in trouble, I guess, internally. It wasn't necessarily external as far as our, our growth and everything that was going on was still there. Um, but we, we had internal politics that had gotten involved. The board was split. Employees were split. Um, so we just had a very difficult time on our hands. To try to overcome, but all the good employees and the, <laughs> which is most everybody. I mean, you always got a few, but all of our employees came together uh, to help make us what we had been and what we needed to be. Um, and you, you were there. You remember a lot of things that happened and a lot of things that we had to do to to overcome the difficulties that we'd gotten ourselves into. Uh, it was a trying time. Uh, I know for a fact. That uh, I, I worked many, many hours <laughs> those first few years uh, beyond my, my, my normal 50. Uh, it was just one of those times where I, I lost about 30 pounds. Um, and it was just, oh, I wish I could lose it now, but I lost <laughs> it back then. <laughs> but it was one of the times that we had to all come together. And, and we did. And we overcame the difficulties that we had. Our board... Even though they didn't want to, they started working together uh, because uh, you know they they had to, um, and and I think that they they realized that. So they did come together, and we did make the changes that we needed to make because about that time is when we uh, started having difficulties at Oglethorpe that we could actually uh, talk about some things there and actually get some things changed at Oglethorpe. So that started about the same time, and then we were having to do all this internal stuff, and then we had uh, difficulties at, at the co-op uh, too. So we had we had from getting it from both sides, from from our outside power supplier as well as the inside, and, and so it was really a trying time, I think, for all of us. But after a few years, it started settling down, and we started making a lot of progress, I think, uh, with the board working with employees. We had not. We needed to build, add on to our, our facilities there for years. We had people, you know, working in halls with their desks in the, in the halls rather than, than having a proper place to, to do what we needed to do for the members. So we did add on to the building. Uh, then we had made plans to do some additional facilities as, as soon as we could buy some land, which I'd been negotiating with our neighbors there for that land for a while. It took me several years, and some of y'all happened me to. To, to get them to agree to sell us the land. Well, once we bought the land, then we could add on and, and, and get some proper facilities for our people to work out of. So I think being able to, to accomplish that in those first few years with employees working together with us making the changes, um, and we, we had become like three separate companies. We had the Snellville EMC, Monroe EMC, and Watkinsville EMC. We just were separate, separated, and that just was not working well for us. 
And so I think people, most people were willing to come together and, and, and make us one organization, which is what we should be. I remember one of the directors telling me, he said, well, I hope you're doing the right thing. If you're not, it's your fault. And uh, I said, well, I think we are. And I think if we don't do this, um, we're, we're going to be in, in worse shape. And he said, all right, I'll vote for it. <laughs> so, so he did. And, and thank goodness it, it turned out to be the, the right thing to do. Um, so that, that, was, that was some trying times back then. So you've, you've already talked about this then. You said one of the things is getting the board work together. One of the things is to move us forward, get facilities. What, did you have any other visions at that time when you became CEO that you felt? Well, I just had a vision to hold on and keep my job for a while. <laughs> Uh, every single board meeting, I had a folder laying up there, and the board knew it. It was my resignation letter. And, and I told them, I said, if y'all can't support me, I'm resigning. And I said, here it lays. If, if you want it, you know where to pick it up. But if you don't do something that's right with the co-op, if you, if you vote against things that need to, be, need to happen, I'm going to give it to you. So for the first few years, that's what happened. And maybe that forced us to work together a little bit better than we would have had I not done that. But, um, you know, when you're, when you're sitting in a new job and you got three, three children at home in school and, you, you know, you, you got a good job. It was a good job, not, not, not to, to say that, and a good place to work. But we just needed to make a lot of improvements that we needed to start working together. And if I couldn't get the board on, 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 on board, um, I, I, I couldn't do what we we needed to do, or what I what I needed to do, try to lead to try to lead them. And it was much easier with employees. Employees wanted to make this place better, and I think the board did too. Is the reason they finally came together as a group. But you know, when you have split board, that, and, and they're good people, but they don't work there. They come once a month. They hear what they hear in in you know in the, through the grapevine. And if the grapevine's wrong, which ours had been wrong several times at Walter MC, if the grapevine's wrong, then the board's getting an, an, an untrue picture, which is what had happened. And uh, so, thank goodness it all came together. And and now after 44 years, I'm retired, and, and I've been manager for 30 years, which is crazy. Um, but it was it was um, you know it was. I think that was the hardest the hardest thing probably was, was getting the board where it needed to be. Employees really came together, I think, quicker than the board did. But the board finally did. We got a good board now too. Um, so it's it's a uh, it's not something I like to think back on too, too much sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was a challenge. When we thought we were gonna be deregulated, we were gonna be competing for for customers. Yes. One of the things that, one of the strategies that we thought was appropriate was to try to tie them to us with more than just their electric service, with other services. Mm -hmm. And so out of all that came a couple of real successful subsidiaries. So how about talking about our subsidiaries and how they came about and what's happened? Well, I felt fairly strongly that we needed to do something to prepare for deregulation. Uh, natural gas uh, has always been a bad word for us, uh, unfortunately, but uh, when the natural gas was deregulated in Georgia, um, I felt like potentially it could be something good for us to get into for our members, that our members could have one bill, they could get one phone call, to pl or one phone company, or one phone number to call, uh, to call us and we could handle both for them. So we looked at that, and the first year we tried to do it, the PSC said no because uh, they were, were re was reading the law a little bit different the way we were reading it. So um, as you remember, we made a concerted effort in the legislature to add co-ops, electric co-ops, to, to that deregulation bill, which we accomplished that, that next year. And I'm convinced that us getting in the in the market kind of helped lower prices at, at the time. Uh, today, I don't think it matters really. We're just another marketer, just like anybody else. But uh, getting in the natural gas business was very good, I think, for our 
members, and I also think it was good for us to prepare for deregulation if it had occurred. It did not occur. So would we have gotten in the natural gas business knowing what I know now? Um, probably. Probably would have because I still think it was the right thing to do. Uh, so we did get in the natural gas business. And about the same time, I'd been talking to, to uh, Jack CMC about security. Uh, I first started out, you may, may not even know this, but I tried to get the Atlanta co-ops together to, to talk about what we could do for our members that would make us closer, closer to our members, even closer than we are. And we met, there was eight of us, eight, eight, eight co-ops. We met like, I don't know, maybe four or five times. We even hired Arthur Anderson, which was before Enron went away. But we hired Arthur Anderson to do a study for us to show what could happen if, if we merged together to come up with a security company, a gas company, uh, other things that we could add, add to our uh, portfolio that we sold to our members. And we all agreed, all eight of us agreed that it was the right thing to do. But through personalities and, and uh, uh, I guess conflicts that we had, um, it, just, it just did not work. But I kept talking to Jackson and Sony about the possibility of still forming a security company. And Sony talked to us for a while and they, they backed out. But Jackson and, and Walton continued to talk and, and we did form a security company. Um, actually hired, our first employee was, was, was Vince Raya. Vince actually was running the Southern Company security company that they started. And we hired him from, from there. Because Vince kind of, I think, knew that Southern was going to get out or going to sell, sell their company. So he came to us. And we, you remember, even our gas company, the first, the first month we had three customers. Two of them were my, with my daughter and my son in their houses. The security company, we had two customers the first month. They were, they were my son and my daughter. So we did, I mean, we started with nothing with those companies. And, and built them up to very, very profitable companies that's been very good for us. AMC Security has just been, I think we serve about 60,000 accounts now, something like that. Uh, gas companies, 75, 80,000, whatever it is. Um, not, not huge by any amount of the, mag, uh, of the imagination, but I think our, our security companies, the top, you know, five, 10, 15 companies in the, in the country, because of the, of the area we serve and, and the numbers that we, we monitor. So they've both been very, very, uh, very good for us, I think, to be able to, to serve our members, but yet to learn something about other businesses as well. Will we ever do anything else? I, I don't know, I can't predict the future. Um, will deregulation ever occur in, the, in, in, in Georgia? <laughs> Probably not, but who knows? I can't predict that as well. Um, but I think we will be prepared for that day if it ever ever does come, because our members are handling phone calls for security, for natural gas, for electricity. So it's not just we're not just tied to the electrical side of the of the business. And as a kind of a, a not, not a side note, but a lot of other co-ops have joined in now. They've seen the benefit of it. And with security, we have uh, maybe six other co-ops that we actually are partnering with us. Uh, we actually let Greystone become a part owner of EMC Security a couple of years ago because they hit, they tried to do it on their own. And uh, I think CFCs, who, who we borrowed money from, of course, that's, they're our banker. But I think they've told us that we have the only security company in the country that any co-op's done that's been very profitable. And uh, I think the co-ops around us have seen what we've done. And, and I know, I think we've got six that, are, that have partnered with us. And even one co-op has partnered with us on the gas side too. So I think there's things that co-ops can do. And sometimes it's just because of personalities that, you know, some won't work with us and some do. But um, I'm, I'm, I've been very pleased of, of of those two things that we did. We had an innovative um, arrangement 
for a generating plant not too far from our office. So you want to talk about that and how significant it was and what happened? Well, to me, that was a lot of fun because that's the kind of thing engineers you know, can really get a grasp of anyway. So we really, in Georgia, we were really in need of having peaking generation. Both of our own none. We had none. So about that time, that was when we were restructuring uh, Oglethorpe anyway, and I happened to be on a power supply committee, and we were trying to talk about what we were going to do with future generation. And some of the co-ops did not want Oglethorpe to ever build anything else. So about that time, we started a project called SMAR, which was uh, two generating uh, or two combustion turbines, CTs, generating units, one at SMAR and one at Sewell Creek. They were going to be built and owned by Oglethorpe. Uh, then we had another situation to arose here in Monroe. We had a site that was really good for some, some generation. So I, I put it in the queue and worked with Enron to, to build a facility there. Enron had some units dispersed around the country. And uh, it was another peaking unit that we actually could get built a little bit quicker than the SMAR units. And this was in 1999, and it was a year that power cost in the summertime went sky high. But anyway, we started in 97, I guess, on the Doyle project. Um, and knowing we could get it probably built quicker than the other, other two projects were being built, the Smart and Jewel Creek. Um, we got Oglethorpe to sign a, a contract to purchase the energy from the Doyle unit. Then Walton MC, we ended up being the banker for the project. We, we borrowed the money from CFC and we loaned it to the Doyle project, which was owned 50% by Enron and 50% by Walton MC. And one of us couldn't outvote the other one. We both had one vote and we both could control each other, kind of. And since Walton MC was the banker, we controlled the money strings that was going into the project. So Enron had those units, so we specified them for the Doyle project. We ended up starting building it once we got the contract signed with Oglethorpe. Um, it was a 15 year contract with Oglethorpe. Uh, I did not know what was going to happen to Enron. I certainly didn't know they were going to go out of existence. But I wanted to make sure that after 15 years that Enron was not involved in it. So in the contract, we put a, um, an agreement in there a, a, that after 15 years, uh, OPC had the right to buy the plant for a X amount of dollars. I can't remember how much it was, but maybe 10 million or something. Um, so that way, I didn't Enron wouldn't be a part of it after the 15 years. And little did I know that after <laughs> two or three years into the project, Enron was going to get in financial trouble and needed money. So Walt MC bought them out, and we actually owned the plant after that, uh, totally. But Oglethorpe was responsible for it because they had the contract to purchase the energy. And I had negotiated in the contract that they were responsible for all the maintenance and all the other expenses too. So for Walt MC, it was, it was no, no money out at all. And they paid us enough every, every month to pay the note off at, at uh, CFC and then actually leave some money for Walt MC as well. So we actually made money on the project for the whole, every year for the whole 15 years. And then when we sold it, we made, we got the, you know, the full price from, from Oglethorpe that we sold it to them. But to be able to, to put that structure together and, and working with, with Enron and OPC and, and uh, even all the local authorities to get it approved, because um, I went down and got a building permit for it <laughs> with, uh, and they said that I should not have got one, and maybe I didn't, shouldn't have, but anyway, the county gave me one. So we had a building permit on it, and uh, we started the project, and then a few people complained, but it was off the road enough and that people didn't see it. Um, but it ended up, we got it built at the right time because there just wasn't a lot of not in my neighborhood uh, kind of thing. We ended up having to buy one of the neighbor's house out later on because of noise. But um, it was just a fun project to build and it gave us a peaking generation. that We actually got it on like in August of 99 and that's when prices shot to $2,000 a megawatt hour. Um, so it saved us a tremendous amount of money that first year. Uh, that was the same time we'd already put in some diesels, you know, on our local distribution system. We put in the gas units over it um, on Highway 53. Um, so they all saved us a tremendous amount of money that year, paid for themselves in one year. 
Um, but that was just a unique project, and, and no other co-op, to, to my knowledge, has ever built generation like that, um, at least not in Georgia. Um, so that, that was a fun project. I wish we still owned it, but, <laughs> but I'm, glad, I'm glad that Oglethorpe owns it anyway, and we're still using it today. But that was just uh, um, one of those things that very ever seldom you get to do in a career, especially in a co-op. Mm -hmm. Along with our natural gas and our security company and the other things we've done, it's, it's just been a, uh, that, that was a fun project. So I really enjoyed that one. Speaking of unique projects, renewables have really come into the spotlight here in the last few years, and we we have done a lot of unique things with renewables with our own program, plus meeting the needs of um, big business that has a desire to go in that direction. So, talk some about what what you've been able to do um, in the renewable realm at Walton EMC. Well, that's been something else has been, that was about as fun, it, it was as fun as the Doyle Project, uh, really. I, I guess I had, I knew that some people, some of our members had started putting some on their houses or at their, at their local residence. And uh, so I said, well, some people would like, might like maybe to be a part of a project, uh, but not necessarily have to put it on their house. So I came, I'd been looking at it for a long time and I realized prices on solar had dropped, really kind of dropped tremendously. So um, I went to, uh, came into the office one day and I told Robert Renfro, who y'all you know Robert, um, I said, Robert, we're going to install some solar panels on our distribution system and, and do a, um, God, I can't think of. Greg, what, what, do we, what do we call it? Cooperative solar. Co -op, cooperative solar. And uh, sell, sell some to our members. <laughs> he, he laughed. He said, have you lost your mind? And I said, well, I don't think so, Robert. I said, but we're going to do it anyway. And he said, he said, we won't sign up 10 people. He said, I can guarantee you we won't. And if we do, I'll, if we do sign up more than that, I'll wash every one of the panels every year for, for you. And I said, all right. So... Uh, Anyway, we ended up uh, doing it. We went through the process of getting it bidded out and, and all. And, and first project we built was a one megawatt project right next to our office. And um, after we got it built, we, you started advertising the program and, and, and doing that. And after we got it built, what, what happened? Have, uh, the wind came through, a little tornado came through or something, and, and we had uh, WSB was out there. Yeah, well, what actually happened was we, we pitched the story to them about this program. You did, yeah. And they wanted to come out, but then we had that wind. Yeah, about the same, about time. same time. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, the, after, after the, when it got on WSP, our, our phone lines just locked up. And we signed up that whole project, what, in like two or three days. <laughs> and uh, Robert and Russell both were very pessimistic about doing that to start with. And uh, to this day, I don't think they washed the panels though. But um, uh, it, it was something that I knew some members wanted. Do, do all, of them want, all of them want it? No, they're not gonna pay more for their power just to get solar. But some of them want it. And, and, and to this day, we still have some people that are, that are buying uh, the solar from us. And we now have uh, about six and a half megawatts on the system. Um, we have the three at three different sites, and and I've been very proud of that. I, I like having those. In fact, we may put some more in our distribution system because uh, I'm gone now. But um, the plan was to put at least one more site, and I know the staff's still talking about that. Um, Which ended up a lot of co-ops all over the country, and even our statewide green power organization basically took uh, what we did as a model. For and actually, plan. Georgia Power did too. Uh, a lady from the PSC came to our office to see what we were doing. And uh, she worked with Jim Batone uh, when Jim worked at the PSC. And she came to our office to see what we were doing. And, and I, met, I met her out in the hall. We talked for a little bit. And she said, I can assure you Georgia Power is going to end up with a program very similar to yours. <laughs> and darn it, they didn't. Instead of $25 a month, I think they charged $25.95 or $99 or something. But... 
Uh, their program is very much like ours. Now, I don't think they've had the success that we did. Um, would I have love for it to take it on uh, more of an interest by a lot of the members? Some members are just not interested in it. Some that have the money and want to put it on their house, they're going to do it. We've probably got five or 600 consumers that have done it. That's going to force us someday to change our rates. Our rates will be more demand, uh, have a demand component than, than they do today. Uh, or now we just charge for energy. Um, but I still think there's a place for solar in, in, our, in our world. Um, and that's very much evident with, with a lot of these large loads like Purina and, 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 and uh, Facebook that we've, we've served. All right, what would you say the biggest change the co-op went through during your tenure? Is I think it's just the growth. Just the physical growth of going from uh, a very small rural co-op to a, to a, I think, very large urban co-op, and then to serve large loads like we serve. What's been the hardest part of your job? Uh, I guess just trying to figure out what we need to do next. Um, since I since I can't read the future, it's just been very diff difficult to try to figure out what's going to happen a month from now or, or a year from now. But you've got to try to make plans uh, for the future uh, as best you can, and then if you have to modify that plan, you have to modify it. And I think just sitting down and thinking about those kind of things rather than getting uh, kind of hung up in the day-to-day -day activities that go on at a co-op, which there's many, but, you know, that's kind of what we have people there for, to do those kind of things. And my job is kind of to, to look to the future and try to figure some things out. And if I don't do that, I don't think I'm doing my job because most people don't, don't want me sitting by there while they do their job every day for our members. So it's been, uh, I, I think that's the biggest challenge is trying to predict the future as much as you can and try to make plans for, for things that you need to do. And I think we've, we've done a pretty good job of that. It's, uh, it's still a challenge, though, to, to do that for any, anybody. What's, what's been the easiest part or, or maybe something you found that was easier than you thought it was going to be? And what have you enjoyed most about your time? Well, what I've enjoyed most in the, is some of the things that we were able to do for employees. That uh, when I first... I kind of always wanted to do this, but when I first became manager, I wanted to make sure that we had some sort of retirement plan in place that when time came that somebody could start thinking about retirement, whether that's 55, whether that's 62, whether that's 65, 70, 75. Uh, I just wanted to have something in place that hopefully a person would be able to do that. Um, that's one reason a number of years ago we did look at getting out of NRSEA and starting our own fund, which we did. Uh, we were able to do more with our 401k and, and the, the new program with uh, the enhanced 401k um, with what we've done with uh, our medical benefits, trying to keep those uh, around when you retire. That makes a big difference. To start the clinic, that we did, um, that people can go to uh, and use those as a, as your doctor or whatever you what are you going to do. And to me, those are the kind of things that I'm I'm probably the proudest of, because employees now when they get to retirement, some of them are able to retire early, and if they can do that and they've made plans to do it, I, I wanted to be able to. Um, so th those probably are some of my. I think my best accomplishments. Um, What's the most surprising thing you ran across during your career? I don't know if it's anything surprising because uh, there's a lot of things that happened that I saw that I wished had not have happened. But, <laughs> but as far as just, just people, the way people react to each other, and most people want to do what's right, they want to do what's good, that they don't want to cause a problem. Um, so it's, it's pulling that together has, has been okay. It's, it's those few that 
think it needs to be another way and won't listen uh, sometimes. You know, that's certainly a challenge, but we have so few of those people around. And, and you usually can, if the good employees will come together that work in an organization, you know, you can, you can overcome those kind of things. And that's one thing that, that I really think has been a good accomplishment here is, is that our, our good employees came together and are continuing to come together to make it this place what it needs to be. Because I can't do it by myself. I couldn't do it by myself. Um, it, it took a lot of us working together to, to get it to where it needed to be. And, and, I, and I'm, that's, I'm very proud of that, to see the, the people that stepped up that, that did what they did to make this a better place. I know you said earlier you can't predict the future, but if what's your best guess? What where do you think we're going? What do you think? Best guess happen? is prices are going up, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, but it, they have everywhere. I mean, to see natural gas last year go to twelve bucks and now it's down under three again. I mean, if natural gas prices were to stay in the three to four dollar range, our our power supply would would be very adequate and, and would be. Um, as reasonable I think it's been in the past. Unfortunately, with the way natural gas prices have gone, uh, I don't know what to predict there. But uh, Vogel coming on is certainly going to be a, a, a challenge for us. Um, and, and just keeping salaries where they need to be um, for our people to maintain the, the level of uh, lifestyle that, that we've all become accustomed to and, and, would, li and would like to have. I think that's going to be a challenge in the future, is being able to keep rates where they are, uh, labor rates. So, I mean, definitely prices are going to go up some for our members, um, but they have been any, along anyway. But Georgia Power's gone up. Georgia Power's going to continue to go up. When they, have, when they put their new fuel charge in place, I don't know what they're going to be at. Uh, I think they're a little over $4 now, or right at 4 Um I, I predict they're going to go to probably five and a half at least. Maybe even, I don't think it'll go to six, but it could. But Vogel's going to impact them too. Vogel's they're going to shoot their rates up some. So I think that's the biggest challenge is just being able to maintain the level of service that we have without, without having some, some increase in, in power cost. Do we all expect it? I think most people do. I mean, gasoline prices now are what, $3 a gallon, a little over? Um, but I, I think that uh, somehow uh, there needs to be a, a reckoning in politics that, that people come together, and, and we just have not done that yet. But I can't say that for Wall MC. With Wall MC, we came together as a group to make it what it needs to be. And I think it'll stay that way, because I think that's what we all want. And, and those that are left, I think that's what they want too. What you gonna miss most? The people. Working with the people. Um, because it was just a it was a joy to see uh, the accomplishments that we were able to make as we worked together as a group. Um, it, it's just a across across the board we've just got a great group of people that are, that are working together. And uh, the board same way, the board uh, is working well together. It's a good board. They care about uh, the members. They care about the employees. And that, they've got to. I mean, that, that's part of their responsibility, too, is the employees, just like they is the members. So if they can help us to do our jobs and ensure that we get the things we need, and they've done that. And I, I think that's uh, a big part of it as well. Is there any message you'd like to leave to employees? Nothing other than what I've said. Continue to work together to make this the kind of place it needs to be, the kind of company it needs to be. Uh, 